Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Dominaria spoilers. So the slow trickle of Dominaria continues. Today we have one mythic, a couple of rares, and a bunch of Planeswalker deck cards. Anyway, let's jump right into it, starting with our one mythic for the day, History of Benalia. And this card, I think a lot of people underrated at first, including myself. When I saw this, without the art and in the leak, without, you know, any of the other stuff going on, I was like, alright, this might be an uncommon, but now that I really think about it and look at it, this card has potential to be really busted. I I don't know how I feel about it being a mythic because it's kind of a spiky card, but the rate you get on this card is actually really, really good. So how History of Benalia works, you play it, you get a 2-2 White Knight with Vigilance. Your next turn, you get another one. So you're getting four power and toughness across two bodies. It's split up over two turns, which is a little annoying, but whatever. And then the next turn, you not only pump your tokens, but you pump all your knight creatures. So worst case, your two knight tokens become four threes, which are pretty big attackers. If you have a bunch of other knights, it gets even crazier. So this card is just one of those cards that's cheaper than you would think it would be for what it does. Before we move on and talk about that aspect of the card, gotta shout out Noah Bradley. The art is amazing. My favorite piece of art we've seen so far from Dominaria. So good job, Noah Bradley, on the super amazing art. As far as the card, it kind of reminds me of a cheaper allied reinforcements or P and Karen Nalar. And this is the biggest argument for why History of Benalia is pretty push. When you get two, two, two tokens, you're usually paying four mana for that. Like, P and Karen is a rare. You're getting four power and toughness across two bodies, three bodies, with a bit of upside, and that costs four mana. So History of Benalia is giving you a one mana discount over similar cards. Maybe the best comparison is actually Liliana's Mastery, as weird as that sounds. Liliana's Mastery gives you a permanent buff to your zombies, and it gives you the tokens all at once, but in some ways, History of Benalia is like the three mana version of Liliana's Mastery for knights. And if you remember, Liliana's Mastery kind of looked like a casual card, when it first came out, and then people realized it was the best card in Zombie Tribal, and Zombie Tribal won a Pro Tour and was a tier deck and just super good. So I actually have high hopes that History of Benalia is going to be really important, partly because we got a lot of good knights in Standard, and we haven't seen them all yet. We still got a ways to go. I try to avoid using cards from the leak because they don't have art yet, but in this case, we got to make an exception for Aerial. So we have curves like Knight of Grace on turn two, turn three, History of Benalia, make a 2-2, two -two, turn four. Or we get another 2-2 two -two for free, play something like Ariel, another huge knight, and then when we untap on turn 5, we're going to sack our History of Benalia, and we are going to make 4 powered attackers out of our knights, out of both knight tokens. Ariel's going to be a 6 power attacker. That's a lot of damage coming across, so I actually have pretty high hopes that because of History of Benalia, and just what a good rate it is, like 4 power across 2 bodies for 3 mana is already pretty insane, and then buffing all your knights, I think this is a card that makes knights tribal a legitimate contender in standard of course we need more support the upside is you already have the best removal in the format you have fatal pushes you have ixlon's binding and cast out so in white and black you already have a lot of great support cards so as long as there's enough good knights i think history of benalia has a legitimate chance of being one of the big sleepers in standard and a tier one standard staple and that's not even to mention the sweetness in modern so history of benalia is the best saga for starfield of nyx so starfield Field of Nyx does some sweet tricks with Saga since it reanimates them on your upkeep. So the idea here is, let's say you can get a History of Benalia in your graveyard, you reanimate it with Starfield, you get a 2-2 Knight, you go to your main phase, you get a 2-2 Knight, so you're getting 4 power and toughness right away. Your next turn, you're going to pump your Knights, History of Benalia goes back to the graveyard, then the following turn, you're getting 2 more 2-2 Knights, so you're basically building a better Bitter Blossom. Like, sure, you skip that one turn here and there, but the fact that you double trigger by reanimating on your upkeep with Starfield makes me really want to play like some sort of white prison-y Starfield deck that just uses History of Benalia for looping power. It seems like that can win the game on its own if you can play some ley lines and some ghostly prisons and stuff to stay alive. History of Benalia is going to win the game just looping with Starfield by itself. So overall, History of Benalia probably underrated right now. I think this card is extremely good. Still, it doesn't feel that mythic to me, but it's mythic in the way that like Voice of Resurgence is mythic. It's a push card that is going to be very good in standard and might have some fringe applications in modern as well. So keep an eye out for this one. I expect this card to be very, very strong. And again, 
The art is amazing. So perfect lineup of super good card with super good art. Moving on, we have another saga. This is the saga that I assumed would be mythic, Fall of the Thran, because Fall of the Thran destroys all lands. That is not something that standard magic cards do. We haven't had an Armageddon in standard for so long. Of course, Fall of the Thran comes with a bit of a drawback. After you destroy all lands, each of the next two turns, each player gets to return two land cards. So you kind of got to build around it a little bit to make it a true Armageddon. But we have options. Sentinel Totem, Crook of Condemnation. You can simply just exile all the lands, and of course, no one can get them back. Phyrexian Scriptures. I know people are excited about this. It seems hard. You got to get the timing just right. So if Phyrexian Scriptures, Lore Counter 3 is happening after all of the Thran comes down. So it is on curve. It is possible, but it is also a little bit tricky and I'm not sure how consistent it'll be to use Phyrexian Scriptures with Fall of the Thran. Regardless, the fact that we just haven't had a Armageddon in Standard is really exciting. Plus, you can build around it, so you get more advantage out of it. So let's say you blow up all the lands. Ramen Up Excavator lets you replay lands from your graveyard. Nissa Vital Force is one of the sneaky ones, because not only does it let you return permanence, so for example, you can get a land back, but if you can ultimate your Nissa as you're getting lands back with modes 2 and 3, of all of the Saran, you're actually drawing cards with the emblem of Nyssa, and the biggest upside of Nyssa is she ultimates so fast, and that's not even to mention jank like World Shaper. So, overall, Fall of the Thran, I figured it would be mythic. It's exciting to see a land destruction, mass land destruction, Armageddon-esque effect return to standard. Just how good it'll be remains to be seen. Is it worth building around? I'm definitely going to try it, because I love blowing up all lands. Also worth mentioning for modern, I mean, we don't have this effect in modern. It's really expensive, maybe not good enough, but if you can reanimate it or something early in the game, there could be some potential there, because in modern, you have tons of builds around, like Leyline of the Void, for example, make sure your opponent is never going to get lands back, you can still get your lands back, so if you can reanimate Fall of the Thran early in the game, you could potentially just hard lock Armageddon your opponent out of the game, so I'm excited to brew around it in standard, brew around it in modern, super sweet to see mass land destruction making a return, so very excited, maybe my favorite card so far from Dominaria. Finally, we got the first eruption, the Red Rare Saga. And this one, I'm not excited about. I just, I don't understand why this card is rare. One thing I've learned from these spoilers is I am super bad at judging rarities on Saga. I have been wrong on every single one so far, I think. So it's kind of this weird mixture of like an electricery, a pyretic ritual, and a sweltering sun, sort of. I don't know. Like, you get to kill little creatures, then you get a ritual effect the next turn, then you gotta sack a land to Sweltering Suns. I'm not sure that Sweltering Suns with Suspend 2 is actually a playable card. That seems pretty easy for opponents to play around. So I think the main hope for First Eruption is maybe it could be a sideboard card to deal with token stacks. Like, that seems like where it shines, is being able to get rid of all the tokens. Otherwise, maybe it's more powerful than it looks. I don't really understand how you make this work, but it feels to me like primarily sideboard for hidden stockpile. Maybe you bring it in against Ramen on Bread if they have a lot of X ones, depending on the specific build. So I don't know about First Eruption. It seems like a long shot to really be a constructed staple, but maybe it has a chance in some sideboards. It just feels so easy to play around the third mode on it, which is easily the most powerful mode. The other two modes, a little sketchy, not exactly sure what you do with them. So I guess we'll have to wait and see, but most likely sideboard playable, not sure about main deck, seems unlikely. One of the less powerful, I think, sagas that we've seen so far. Finally today, we got all of the Planeswalker deck cards, so I'm not going to spend too long talking about them. These cards are essentially never standard playable, but Chandra Bold Pyromancer from the Chandra deck, uh, I mean, I guess it's fine. It adds some mana, it kills some stuff. I think for six mana, though, probably not going to show up in constructed decks. You can tutor it up with Chandra's Outburst. A little bit expensive, although nicely on curve with Chandra. Five mana, Outburst something, six mana mana player Chandra. Carpoose and Hound, eh. I mean, it's a hill giant. It has some upside of shocking things if you have a Chandra. I don't think the fact that you can play it with any Chandra is actually going to make a difference. Like, yes, Chandra Torture Defiance, very, very strong and standard. I don't think you play Carpoose and Hound because of that. And then Pyromanic Pilgrim, 
Eh, it's a fine creature. Not exciting, though. As far as the Teferi deck, we got Teferi Timebender, which, I mean, is reasonable. Extra turns, always nice. The problem is a plus two doesn't do much. Like, I guess you can untap a blocker to try to keep your Teferi alive. Uh, negative two, you can do it once to draw two, but for six mana, draw two, gain two, just not that great. So, again, fun card. Not sure about Constructed. Nambia Faithful Healer is the tutor for Teferi. Interesting that it's a legendary creature, the flavor is sweet, it's Teferi's daughter, but as far as being playable, eh, not really. Teferi Sentinel, if there is a really push Teferi, maybe? I mean, a 6-6 six, six for 5 is not horrible, it is colorless, so you can play in anything. It's an artifact if those synergies matter. But I'm not sure if Vanilla 6-6 six, six for 5 is playable in standard, even if the other Teferi ends up being good. And then Temporal Machinations, a little over-costed. Bounce a creature for 3 at sorcery speed. Drawing a card is a nice upside. So, overall... I don't think any of the Planeswalker deck stuff is going to end up seeing play. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Meandering River, Timber Gorge. Just assume that this land cycle is always legal and standard, because somehow it always is. Uh, I guess it's fine for budget decks. I'm glad that this cycle is evergreen. Good for ultra-budget players, but definitely not exciting land. So anyway, those have been our daily Dominaria spoilers for today. So how good is History of Benalia? Is that card underrated? Is it super pushed? Is it going to be one of the better cards in standard? What's your opinion? I think that it's going to be super good. But I want to hear what you have to think. How about Fall of the Thread? What other ways can we build around it? How can we abuse the mass land destruction? How about the Red Saga? Is there any applications I'm missing? Do any of the Planeswalker deck cards have a shot in standard? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.